ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today's a day I love, National Milk Day. It's the day Joe's mom makes her delicious chocolate chip cookies. We pour big glasses of milk and party! And speaking of love, here today to help us explore the links between love and money, we welcome Stanford professor Myra Strober. And how about this for a headline segment? We might be investing in a little different environment now than we were 12 months ago. Here to talk about what you may need to change with your money, we welcome the head of investment and trading services at Vanguard Investments, James Martielli. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline, and then I'll share some mouth-watering trivia. And now, two guys who are the cookies and milk on this podcast. I don't think I like that. Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. This makes me uncomfortable. Cookies and milk make you uncomfortable? You, you guys, get uncomfortable in a you hurry. You guys being edible somehow makes me very uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't know, but wow. Hey, everybody, welcome to Wednesday on the Stacky Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and we're so glad you're here. Get ready, buckle up for some money fun. We've got some fairly deep topics today, and the guy sitting across the card table, let's introduce him to all of you right now. He's the man whose sources say had an emotion once. It's uh, Mr. OG. How are you, man? Is that uh, what Smokey Robinson meant when I wanted a second emotion? Isn't that what he said in his song? I want a second emotion or something. Dun, dun, I don't, dun, I don't dun, know. Dun. Maybe not, but uh, pulling Smokey Robinson out on a Wednesday morning early. I had it in my head. I needed a little help from the audience. Can you keep singing? I, I just, I'm not, I'm not clear on what song you're singing. Cool. I'd love to. Just obvious real there. Hey, uh, and let's also say hello. That emotion is. Annoyance. <laughs> Press that button. Let's also say hello to the guy who gladly pay you Tuesday for a cheeseburger today. It's uh, Mom's Neighbor Doug. Yeah, you got to hand me three cheeseburgers before I'm shelling out any money. Like, that's where I get started. That's the entry fee. And that OG is why he never gets cheeseburgers from us. That's exactly why. It's like, no. I also can't no. understand why I'm not I losing mean, weight. My son started ordering two cheeseburgers for dinner now, which I thought was a very special. Special moment in my financial life. My kids start eating two meals for one meal. Like, oh, good, you're gonna have two cheeseburgers. Of course. Why wouldn't the you? bank account goes down even quicker? Wait till when he leaves home. If it's like Nick, my son, you know, who's not a huge dude, but was captain of his swim team when he left and went to the University of Texas, and they told me what the cost was going to be to feed him in the dorms. I was like, I will take that. Like, yeah. <laughs> University of Texas loses that deal every time on feeding my kid. Yeah. Seems like it, huh? Yeah, you're headed that way. We got a great show. We got Professor Myra Strober here from uh, Stanford. Money and love. You know, often we feel like, oh, gee, we've got to make this decision. Do I chase what I love? Do I chase money? She and another fantastic author, Abby Davidson, have uh, done a lot of research in this area and are going to talk about is there a middle ground and they think there is. There's a process to try to chase both. But before we get that, we're going to talk to Vanguard. But even before that, you know something, Doug, that I've worried about over and over and over since we talked last? I've thought not enough people, well, not enough people concerned with these things. Well, guess what happened to me today? I spoke with Jesse, my MetPro coach about making sure that my health and wellness goals are in place. Because if I'm going to get my net worth goals, I'm going to need myself to be strong and ready to get there. I need to be in the moment and I need to be ready to react to any situation. And I can't do that if my brain is sloppy and my body gives out on me. And that's why I've been working for a number of years with MetPro. You may have heard Angelo Poli on our program before. 
Angelo believes that all these fad diets are not the answer. Certainly they will work for a short amount of time, but the key to getting where you want to go is to follow your metabolism. And because we're all built differently, we can use our metabolism as the key to unlock consistent growth when it comes to either being stronger, maintaining our ability to extend the workday or keep the workday, or number three, to just be present in the moment. I was able last year to go to 40 cities on my book tour. And during that entire time, I was able to stay focused, stay in the moment while staying at hotels, eating at restaurants. It was difficult, but MetPro and my MetPro coach helped me do it. So for a free assessment, and to talk to MetPro about how you can do better with your health and wellness in 2023, head to metpro.co. That's not metpro.com. It's metpro.co slash SB, metpro.co slash SB for a free metabolism assessment and to speak to them about how they can help you in a partnership to be better in 2023. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help. It's time for the B-A-Q-A-A, the B-A-Q-A, what you say, the B-A-A. Brown Ambition question answers. You have questions, we have some answers. We are not your therapist, not your financial advisor, your attorney, but we are two smart brown girls when it comes to money, career, business. Brown Ambition, listen wherever you get your podcasts. Don't you feel better now that people know about all these fantastic opportunities? I was worried about the people not knowing about the opportunities, and now they do. So, yes, I feel better. Yeah, it's great. James Martielli from Vanguard, Myra Strober from Stanford are here. So let's uh, get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Well, OG, a game that you and I don't play is looking into the crystal ball, but uh, these big mutual fund companies have people on the payroll who do this every year. I mean, it's a new year, new conditions, right, OG? Yep. Same boss, old boss, new boss, same as the old boss, same as the new boss, kind of same deal. Yep. Look at OG with all the musical references today. (laughs) New markets, new opportunities. I asked James Martielli recently from Vanguard on a live recording session on an app called Fireside about what he thought when when their economist at Vanguard look into the crystal ball. What do they think is coming for 2023? And uh, when I asked him that question, I really like the way he started it. Let's listen in. I think it's always good to start off with where we came from and then we can start looking ahead. So. If you look at for the last 10-ish years or so, inflation was humming along around 2% until summer of 2021 when things started to open up after some of the uh, COVID was uh, a little bit behind us. And you really started to see inflation tick up pretty high. And in fact, it it hit, gosh, about 9% if you measure it by, they call it this uh, consumer price index back in June. Now, the good news is, it's starting to come down a bit. In fact, we just got another reading this morning uh, where that's a touch over 7%. And if you look at inflation, there's really two main drivers uh, when you're taking a look at it. One is the goods, so it's the things that you buy. And then the other thing is services. So if you're looking at, well, what's, what's starting to come down? A lot of it's been the goods section. I'm sure you've seen it filling up your tank of gas, it's not quite as as expensive. So that's starting to come down. We think in 2023, some of the shelter type of expenses, so rent and and home, that will start to come down. What's a little bit sticky, as they might say, is um, actually wage inflation is still hasn't really come down on the services side. So that's a a long lead up to saying, we don't think the the Federal Reserve will get to that 2% target that they're looking to get to long term by the end of 2023. But we do think there's going to be some meaningful progress on lowering inflation. Maybe it's a a touch north of that. Maybe it's like a a three or so by the time we get to the end of the year. That, uh, to me, OG, overall sounds really good. I like him parsing between goods and services about these basic things these basic things that we need in our life, the inflation on those largely coming back, uh, floating back down to normal. It seems to me that if you can keep your budget in check, 
that if Vanguard is right on this one, this could be a good year for a family that's fairly frugal. Or it'll be getting back to normal. Yeah. I mean, after a, a year and a half or so of escalating or rising prices, I'll be interested to see how it all kind of plays out because I haven't seen it really happen in the food or energy component, which everybody conveniently points out the CPI. But of course, you know, the government issued price index doesn't include food or energy in, in its calculation, which I don't know about you, but that seems to be a top line item in the budget. It's like housing, food, heat, water, gas for the house. And that number, those numbers specifically, I know you mentioned housing prices coming down or, or housing costs coming down. That's not going to affect people that have a mortgage. Your mortgage is your mortgage, right? Maybe taxes and insurance. Uh, no, but he's, he's talking more about the utility bill, about the basic cost of living, those goods, the grocery yeah. store stuff, those starting to moderate. I haven't seen it in real life, but maybe maybe it's happening. I mean, meat still seems really expensive. Our electric bill is no less than 3x what it was three years ago. It's a little obscene, actually. I don't think he's talking about those prices coming down as much as the fact that they skyrocketed and we're seeing them, we're seeing them now flatline much more than yeah. what he talked about with wages, right? With wages and with interest rates. He talks about the Fed still raising interest rates and probably continuing to raise interest rates that we can see anything affected by those things still, still continuing. But hopefully, hopefully the price of energy at least moderates. The rate of increase decreases. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> it's decreasing. No, it's still increasing, but it's decreasing at a slower rate, so that's good. <laughs> you want to see the dogs again or the ponies? Which which do yeah. you want to see? Kind of feels like that a little bit, huh? Well, and in this different environment, right, do we look at our investments differently? So I asked James about that. James, by the way, and I didn't tell anyone, uh, Doug, I think you did in the intro, but I did not. James Martielli is the head of investment and trading services at uh, Vanguard Investments. And I asked him next, does this mean we look differently at our investments if things are a little different this year? And this is what he had to say. Well, the nice thing about working at Vanguard and the philosophy is it's a kind of a timeless and universal, right? So we would advise folks to, or suggest to folks to you know focus on the things that you can control as opposed to trying to worry about the things that you really can't control. There's some really basic principles that we would encourage folks to, to really consider no matter what the environment is. So the first thing we would say is, you know, ask yourself, what are the goals that I have for this investment? Is it, you know, a longer term, medium term, short term? And then the next thing is, do I have the right balance or mix of assets that align with what those uh, goals and time horizon is? Uh, the third thing, one of the few things you really, really can control is your costs. So be mindful of your costs. And, you know, that's the one thing that you know for certainty. You don't know what the markets are going yeah. to do, but yeah. you are going to know what you're going to pay. And then the most difficult thing, easiest to say, but, you know, really the most difficult thing is having that discipline and really trying to tune out all the noise and the headlines. And, you know, if your goals haven't really changed, and you know, maybe you do a little bit of rebalancing perhaps, but more often than not, like sticking to that plan and having that discipline and maybe if you can't do it on your own, maybe you know, having some good high quality, low cost advice might be helpful to keep yourself from being your own worst enemy in many, many instances. Our, our founder, Jack Bogle, has a, he has a plethora of quotes to choose from, but one that comes to mind is, uh, don't do something, stand there. So oftentimes, <laughs> You know, that could be some of the best advice. He should be OG just sitting here with us. I feel like James is on the same page as you are with everything that he said right there. Yeah, I mean, obviously the biggest determinant in your long-term investment success is, um, or maybe not obviously, but the biggest determinant in long-term investor success is their behavior. And now is the time of year when everybody looks at their investment statements and they look at their 401ks and they decide, what, what, what do I do about this? And the right answer probably is mm, kind of nothing. I was talking to somebody a couple of days ago and they said, uh, maybe I should have gone to cash in 2019. And I said, have you looked back since 2019? You, you would have lost money on that deal. Well, yeah, but I wouldn't have gone down 20% last year. 
Yeah, but you would still be lower. <laughs> like the minus 20 is as a result of the two years of plus 30. You're still ahead if you look at kind of the long-term growth lines and stuff like that, which is great. But the reality is, is that making the decision to go to cash, yeah, would have been a really smart thing to do last January. You know, this time a year ago, if you would have done that and sat in cash the entire year, of course, you would have more money today. But hindsight's always twenty twenty. When you think about doing it, it's probably too late. So now that you're looking at your investment account and you're saying, oh my gosh, I'm down 20% for the year, what do I do? The right answer is kind of sort of nothing. You know, rebalance, you should do that if you haven't done that in a while. Add more money if you have it available and not spending it on your electric bill or eggs or chicken. But otherwise, I don't think that now is the right time to make any changes to your investment plan. I love that quote. Don't do something, just stay in there. Yeah. It's fabulous. And how many people listened to the beginning of this discussion thought that, you know, based on all those things James said, that he was going to come up with this new strategy that we need to have, right? I feel like as conditions change, we're always looking, OG, for this new strategy. And there isn't one. Yeah. Everybody wants the, the new, new thing. It's the same as the old thing. Like we just said. It was so great to hear James uh, say that instead of just us hitting that over and over and over. Uh, by the way, I Won't asked him also. Again. <laughs> I know. I asked him about bonds with interest rates higher. There are some opportunities there. I asked him about this move toward individualized indexing. They bought a company, as you know, OG, that does that. So they're they're also playing that game. We reported a lot on these individual indexes. You can build yourself just for you asked him questions about those. You can hear his answer on those things on our YouTube channel. We'll have a link in our show notes. But if you go to the Stacky Benjamins YouTube page, you'll see the entire discussion with James. But man, if you just wanted the bullet point, you got it here from OG and James. Different year, same, same stuff. I think that's a great takeaway. Coming up next, Myra Strober is a labor economist and Professor Emerita at Stanford University. She was the founding director of the Stanford Center for Research on Women, first chair of the National Council for Research on Women. She is the co-author of a new book where a lot of people are trying to choose between love and money. Which one do I chase? Do I chase that thing that I, that I absolutely love but doesn't pay well? Is there a middle ground? Well, she thinks that she's found it. We're going to dive into that in just a moment. But as a way to get there, Doug, I think you've got a little trivia for us. Oh, do I have trivia, Joe? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And on today's date in 1787, William Herschel discovered the first two moons of Uranus. Don't get ahead of me, people. Choke back that joke you're thinking of. It was a huge astronomical event. Lots of money has been spent researching and discovering the stars, but far more has been made writing stories with the names these moons are based on. Books that many have read while sitting on the throne. So that's today's trivia question. Name one of the two authors who wrote the characters whom most of the moons of Uranus, it's just fun. both, I dare ya. I'll be back with the answer right after I go restock Joe's mom's toilet paper roller. She gets so angry. Well, if it's time for you to put together your strategy to get your debt plan together, Navy Federal can help you in many ways. If 2023 is presenting you with opportunities or cleanup, well, there's lots of different things you can do. First, partner up with Navy Federal Credit Union to pay down your credit card debt. You could get a low intro APR on balance transfers with their platinum credit card. It's their lowest rate card, and it's a great tool to minimize interest while you're paying down debt. Navy Federal can also help you get started on your next home improvement project in 2023. They offer a home equity line of credit with convenient access to funds when you need them at a variable rate. You can also get a fixed rate equity loan that has set monthly payments for large purchases. Consolidating debt with a home equity loan could also streamline and lower your monthly payments. Stackers, start out with your plan and then plug in exactly how you're going to strategically use debt. If you do it the other way around, it doesn't work nearly as well. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Our members are the mission. 
Insured by NCUA, equal housing lending, membership required. Loan subject to approval. Call 1-888-842-6328 for details about credit cost and terms. HELOC APR is low as 6.5% as of November 23rd, 2022. Stackers, I'm Uranus Inspector and Full Moon Howler, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You're laughing right now. I know you are. You know, talking about full moons reminds me of the time I accidentally caught Joe's mom skinny dipping. The following scene contained graphic violence, nudity, and adult language. Never again. But let's just flush those stories away before this whole show goes in the toilet. Too late. We're here talking about Uranus and the first two moons. Like many of the others, named after characters penned by which authors? Well, those first moons were named Oberon and Titiana from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, I've had many A Midsummer Night's Dream about two moons, believe me. And this dream was written by a guy named Billy Shakespeare. Well, there are 27 moons in all floating around Uranus, so I guess Uranus is a busy place. It's just, you really can't say that without making a joke, can you? <laughs> the other author is Alexander Pope. And now, here to help the planets align when it comes to your money and love, let's say hello to Professor Emeritus, Myra Strober. And Myra Strober joins us. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. We actually have some rain here in Northern California. Isn't there, there's a song about that, right? That it never rains in, oh, that's Southern California. It doesn't rain, it pours, right? Is that the song? I don't know, but we haven't had this kind of rain in a while, so we're all excited. I was going to say, maybe needs it. Hey, it's funny because talking about rain, there's plenty of people out there, as you know, that rain tears when they think about having to choose between love or money. And before we dive into this project with you and Abby, I love for the creators out there to hear the origin story of this. Why the two of you and why this topic of love and money? Well, this book was launched at a lunch at the Stanford Business School. I taught a course for, oh gosh, close to 40 years on work and family. And Abby was a student in that course, and she had come back with her husband as a guest speaker in the course. And she uh, emailed me and said she'd like to get together and have lunch. So she came down and we had lunch at this lovely little outdoor restaurant. I had just retired and she was interested in what I was going to do next. And I said, well, now that I'd retired, I wanted to bring the content of this course on work and family to a larger group. As we were talking, I thought she would be an amazing co-author. And so I asked her right then and there, would you like to co-author this book with me? She said she would. So we were off and running. That's the origin story. <laughs> that is fabulous. Well, and you describe early in the work as well that a lot of your career, speaking about retiring, your career, you had a love and money situation yourself in 1970. Can we talk about that? I think this is a wonderful personal place to start for a lot of our listeners. Yes. In 1970, uh, my husband and I moved to California, my first husband. I had been teaching at the University of Maryland happily, but he got a wonderful offer at Stanford uh, that he wanted to take. And we agreed that I would leave the University of Maryland and come to California. So I started looking for a job at Stanford. And in those days, your thesis advisor really had to help you get a job. There was no open job market. And my thesis advisor didn't know anybody at Stanford, but he did know someone at Berkeley. And so I got a job at Berkeley, but it was not a regular faculty job. It was a, as a lecturer. On my first day at Berkeley, I saw two of my former classmates at MIT in the economics PhD program, and they were both assistant professors. So I made an appointment to see the chair of the department and asked him how come these two guys were assistant professors, and I was a lowly lecturer. And he said, 
it's because you live in Palo Alto. And I thought, wow, you learn something new every day. I didn't know. I didn't say this to him. I didn't know you had yeah. to live in Berkeley to be on their regular faculty. So I got in my car and drove home. And I always say I became a feminist on the Bay Bridge because it suddenly hit me <laughs> that this was ridiculous and that uh, <laughs> you didn't have to live in Berkeley. Well, I called his office the following morning and they said he was very busy, couldn't see me for several weeks. And finally, I got to see him again. And I said, I want to pose the same question that I asked you before. And I'd like a frank answer this time. He said, it's because we don't know what's going to happen to you. I said, what do you mean you don't know what's going to happen to me? I'm not asking you to give me tenure. I'm asking you to put me on the tenure track. And in six years, we'll all see what happens to me. He said, no, no, we can't do that. I could never sell that to the department. You have an infant and a three-year-old, and uh, we just don't know what's going to happen to you. So there it was, love and money, right in front of me. <laughs> and by the way, your course ends up becoming one of the most popular courses out there. I felt like reading it like, they had to see the light a little bit at a time, Myra. <laughs> just, just finally see see the light, and you brought them dragging. But you, you actually write this. I love this quote. Challenging times can force us to reassess our lives in ways that ultimately lead to better outcomes. Clearly, you've had a wonderful outcome, but that was a crazy challenging time. And I feel like the timing on this book, because of the fact that it's right at the end of coronavirus, there's a lot of people in that boat right now, Myra. I've got to believe there's a bunch of people now as the w lines between work and love are more blurred than ever. Like this is this is a crucial time for a lot of people. Right. And a lot of people like to believe that love and money are separate, that you make love decisions with your heart and money work decisions with your head and never the twain shall meet. And the thesis of the book is that love and money are intertwined. You need both your head and your heart to make both kinds of decisions. Well, she's not here to tell her story. Could you tell us Abby's story as well? Because you also kick off the introduction with Abby's story and the introduction of her and this issue. Is that Abby's story or is that a story that we tell? I believe this may be a different story. I think we start the book with a woman who has just been admitted to graduate school. We do. That, this is this is Lauren. You're right. Yeah. And You're right. This is Lauren. Lauren. And that's the same time that she gets a proposal from the man that she's been seeing, but he's not willing to think about moving so that she can go to graduate school. And so she has to decide, uh, is she going to accept this proposal or go to graduate school? And um, that's right. Lauren decides that she's going to go to graduate school. It's very tough when you're in love with someone and they don't see that uh, your career and your life is to be considered. And so she broke off the engagement. And that's the story, of Lauren. One thing that's clear from the very beginning, and you mentioned this just a moment ago, Myra, is planning. And we don't think about planning and love in the same sentence, right? Love carries you away. Love, you know, you're enraptured. And yet you say that love is not a fairy tale and money is not a limitation. Explain that because we don't often associate love with planning. I, I don't want in the least to denigrate love. <laughs> it's one of the most powerful and delightful emotions. And of course, at first, it's different from the way it is after a while. But we can't live on love alone. <laughs> Not probably even on a desert island, but certainly not in our society. And so what we say in the book is, yes, be in love, enjoy love, but talk to this person about what your life together is going to be like. What is it each of you wants? What is it that each of you is prepared to bring to the relationship? And we can go into more detail on the questions we think people should ask. But it's not just that you fall in love and then you pick out your wedding gown and off you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, it, it just, as I was reading, it reminded me of a phrase that a mentor once taught me, which is that love is not a noun, love is a verb. And as a verb, it requires action, it requires work. And, and that is clear when we get here to the five C's, which you very much lay out the five considerations, you call them the five C's, it's the framework of the book. And while obviously, we're not going to take the time to go through all of it, I'd love for people to dive in and do that. Uh, once they hear this interview, to get there, though, what I'd like to what people I think have to know to bridge before we get to the five C's is an idea from Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman, I think is how you pronounce his name. And they're called System One and System Two when it comes to your decision making. Can we walk through this process briefly? Because I think this really sets up the five C's nicely. Yes, exactly. So Daniel Kahneman talks about system one thinking, which can be easily translated as making decisions with your gut. A question comes up and you have a feeling, perhaps a really strong feeling, and you make the decision with your gut. Uh, and the funny thing is that Abby and I made the decision to write this book together with our gut. <laughs> so we're fallible also. But in general, the idea that Kahneman has is that you shouldn't make decisions with your gut. You should use system two thinking, which requires your head. His point is that system two thinking slows you down. Making a decision with your head is a much slower process than making a decision with your gut because you have to think about a number of things. And so in many ways, you're absolutely right. Our framework goes into detail about what you should be thinking about and how you should be thinking about it uh, when you use system two thinking. Fans of this show have heard us talk about, you know, a financial plan begins with beginning with the end in mind, which is exactly where your five steps begin. Clarify what's important to you. You tell this great story about Lauren and Greg, Lauren choosing between grad school and her love of Greg. She doesn't want to choose between these two things and they're pulling her apart. The goals are, are important, but also getting, I guess, clear about how these goals rate against each other. Yes. So what we talk about as the first step in the framework is clarify, clarify what it is that you want. And in the case of Lauren, she, after much thinking, became clear that she wanted a career, that she wanted to spend her life not only with someone she loved and have children, but she also wanted a career. And the more she thought about it, the more this did not seem possible with Greg, because even at step one, stage one, he was not willing to consider her career in their decision making. So in her case, Lauren's case, clarify was relatively easy. She had only herself to consult about this <laughs> because she already had information from Greg that led her to understand where he was coming from. When you have a couple making a decision, clarify is much more complex because you clarify for yourself and then, if I may move ahead just a moment to the second step of the framework, which is communicate, you need to communicate that decision to whoever else is involved. And in the course of communicating, the other person has hopefully clarified his or her stance. So each of you have clarified. Now you're communicating. And guess what? My clarification for myself may change, may change a lot after I hear my partner's clarification of what it is he or she wants. So, <laughs> so this clarify and communicate can go round and round several times before the two of you figure out what your decision is going to be. This is what I love about Lauren and Greg's story, frankly, is that while it doesn't have a happy ending, Myra, for them together, it does have a happy ending for them separately. And sometimes this great communication creates this outcome 
that maybe doesn't seem happy in the moment, but we're all better off. Well, and that gets us to the last point of our framework, which is look at the consequences. In the long term, their consequences were good for both of them. In the short term, the consequences were very painful for both of them. You know, to break up a relationship that's been going on for several years that might have resulted in marriage is just extremely painful. And so to be able to say, well, yes, I'm going to go through the short-term pain in order to reap the long-term rewards is definitely part of decision-making. I want to put a little texture on this step one and step two for a moment before we move on, which is your goals, you point out, are important. And I think there's a a percentage of our audience that goes, yeah, 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 I know what I want, okay, whatever. Because in my career as a financial planner, (laughs) that was always, yeah, yeah, this is not, okay, this is the boring. This is super important because you two point out that it's your goals that are important. And often we're dealing with the community's goals for us. And this idea that goals have been made that are truly maybe not my goal. They might be somebody else's goal. Well, I agree. That is really important in the clarification process that you may think, you know what you want, but if you go a little bit deeper and sometimes you need the help of a therapist or a counselor to do that, Uh, you realize that those are not really your goals. Those are the goals that your parents or your aunt and uncle or your teacher somewhere along the line instilled in you. And in fact, if you are honest, you would would like to get rid of those goals (laughs) and substitute some other goals. So yes, that's part of the clarification process. Are these really my goals? Is this really what I want? I feel like that's the basis of nearly every Hallmark movie people watched back in December, which was, you know, once they got clear about what they wanted, they, they then decided not to marry Chad and things were, no, I'm kidding. But let's talk about communication here because you also write that, and I think this is important, an important point. And I bet you saw this all through your career. You write communication isn't always polite and calm. Can you talk about that for a moment? It's nice if both parties try to make it calm. And I think it's very important when you are going to communicate something that's potentially life-changing to warn the other person that this is what you have in mind and agree on a time and a place to discuss this, which suits you both. I think back to my first marriage And I remember trying to communicate really important things to my first husband after I had finished the dishes and he was sitting and doing some work. And I'd walk into the living room and say, I need to talk with you about this. And he would say, well, you know, just a minute, I got to finish this page. And then he'd finish. And, you know, he had three minutes to talk about something that required three hours. That's not a good way to go. And it needs to be in private so that the kids are not, you know, waking up and asking for a drink of water while you're talking. So set it up to be as calm as possible. And then, yeah, the fireworks may erupt. And maybe you'll say, too much fireworks tonight. Let's finish this on Sunday when we go to X. So communication is ongoing. It can be tough. It can be a long process if you both keep clarifying and changing your mind, but that's what life is about. I felt like you and Abby were pilots and, uh, you know, I was just on a plane recently and they warned us that it it was going to get a little choppy. And then five minutes later it was, I think warning people ahead of time that it's okay that this gets a little emotional is fantastic because I believe, you know, if these are big things in your life, of course it's going to be emotional. The third step that you walk through, and this is a big one. This was a big one in my personal life. Consider a broad range of choices. Are you saying that we look too narrowly at first? Yes. I think that very often when these love and money conflicts arise, they get solved by coming up with a solution that none of you thought about before. And one of the examples we give in the book 
is two people uh, originally from China, both got business degrees, both got fantastic job offers in San Francisco, and then had a baby and realized that they couldn't both uh, be in these jobs, which required a tremendous amount of travel uh, without having basically a third parent, which they defined as a nanny. So they did extensive nanny searches, including an agency and so on, interviewed a whole bunch of people and decided that none of them would fill the bill. So how are they going to both have these amazing careers and this wonderful new child with no nanny? After much consternation, they realize that the answer to this problem is to move back to Shanghai where their parents lived and their parents, when they asked them, were willing to be the child rearers when they were on business trips. They asked their company and the company had offices in China and it all worked out. But at the beginning, had they not broadened their horizons and looked at choices that they hadn't considered, they would have been stuck in this, you know, how are we going to do this question? It, it's so powerful. It was powerful in my own life. Cheryl was not happy in her job in Detroit. Things were going well for me. And we actually went through all of this personally. We started off with, well, maybe we will commute back and forth. And then we thought about, well, does Cheryl even need to work? I mean, does she want to work? And so we went through this whole thing of what color is my rainbow and should I continue or not? And we did that on hikes. We had such a great time with that. And walking through, walking through this decision, you know what we decided to do? We decided on this weird thing after four or five days of talking, and it was we decided to sell everything and just become nomadic. And that's not actually what happened, but I d it definitely resonated with me when I was reading your story to not take these first few things and just stop there to really almost, I feel like taking out the whiteboard and really thinking about all the possibilities and giving it some time. So that book, what color, I think it's what color is your parachute? <laughs> right. Is that <laughs> well, well, that well, that's kind of what it felt like at the time. Like we should have had what color is your parachute? Yeah, yeah. So I remember that book was very valuable in clarifying what it is you want. Just going through all of those. Uh, step four: check in with friends, family, and other resources. Just like I mentioned earlier, maybe having that whiteboard out and looking at all the different options, like your uh, story about the people that moved to Shanghai or my personal story. This one seems very important because you might learn things that you didn't know were on the table. Yes. The only caveat here is choose carefully the persons that you check in with. Oh, so, good, good, good tip. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, let me put in a plug for financial advisors here because I think that a lot of people feel, oh, I can do this myself. You know, I, I can figure out when I should retire by going to some website and figuring it all out. And you need to check in with experts about. <laughs> about your retirement funds and are they adequate and how should they be invested and so on. So you need experts, but then you also need friends and family, but you need the right ones. Checking in can give you all sorts of ideas in terms of broadening your horizons, in terms of deciding whether you're on the right path. Suppose you're thinking about marrying someone and you want to know if a trusted friend thinks that this is the right person for you. This is a friend who knows you well. Introduce the person to that friend and see what they have to say. You know, you don't necessarily have to take their advice, but it's good to know if people think that uh, you're on the right path or on the wrong path. So I think checking in is a critical part of making decisions. It's, it's funny. It reminds me of uh, Walt Disney, who used to uh, dress up in disguise and ask people in lines for attractions what they thought of Disney. 
And he got some, he got some really unfiltered responses when he did that. <laughs> yeah. It's like sending a draft of an article to people who write back and say, really? and then of course step five is explore likely consequences and i love how for me myra this is a lot like the business world you know we're thinking about uh uh this almost as if we're business you talk about businesses now have what's called a pre-mortem and this is very much like what businesses do yes you know i think this is so important in retirement decisions think about the consequences of you retiring what are you going to be doing every day when you're retired? Do you have a plan? Are you just going to let it flow? Does that work for you? You know, lots of people retire because they have a specific thing to do. Other people say they'll figure it out after they retire, and some of them do. But thinking about what it is you're going to do and, and how you're going to finance that is really critical. The book is, uh, it's just an amazing project. It's called Money and Love, an Intelligent Roadmap for Life's Biggest Decisions. It is definitely a thoughtful look at love and money and about how you truly can meld the two of these. And I imagine it was available everywhere yesterday. Exactly. Thank you so much for including us in this discussion. And man, as a lead up to Valentine's Day, I think getting all this right is just a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, I'm Mr. Wow. And I'm Mrs. Wow from Waffles on Wednesday. And when we're not eating waffles, we're stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Dr. Strober for hanging out with us. And uh, OG, the, the only show on earth that can take a Stanford professor and introduce it with some toilet humor. Uranus jokes. Just not I love something it. not right about that writing. But there is a middle ground, I'm glad to hear, where, where you decide which you're going to chase and how you're going to chase them. But I love this idea that it's all about communication, OG. Whoever your life partners are or you think they might be, the more you communicate about your goals, the easier some of these tough decisions are going to be because you don't necessarily have to choose if you're going to go chase somebody else's dream or chase your own dream, the more you communicate, it appears like the solution always appears. Well, you're putting it out there for everybody to kind of help move you in the direction of the things that you want to do. And, and when you have more people rowing in the same direction, it's obviously going to, going to help, even if it's subconsciously, which is a whole nother level of, all of this, I think. So yeah, you should, you should let everybody know what you want to do. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a great quote that says the same brain that got you into this mess is not going to get you out of it, right? Mm -hmm. It takes a different brain and surrounding yourself with smart people. I mean, I feel like a theme that we've had so far in the month of January has been around better decision-making. Let's not be overcommitted. Let's not have to decide between love and money. Let's put a plan in place. I feel like making better decisions means in 2023, maybe doing a better job with your board of directors. Like who's, who are the people that you're surrounding yourself with to make these decisions? Well, not only who you're making decisions with, but also I think you can just stop at who are you surrounding yourself with? If you're kind of stuck, you kind of have to look at, uh, look at your supporting cast a little bit. And there is some truth to the saying that, you know, you're the average of the five people you hang out with the most. So when I feel like I'm getting dragged down a whole bunch, I try to record a little less and, you know. Oh, wow. Oh, I just got that. Oh, you see that? Zing. I thought he's going to make it all the way through this without taking a swing at us. Nope. Yeah. Nope. No. Try to just show up, do my thing, and get out of here. <laughs> Time for us to pivot. Let's throw out David Lifeline. Tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends, OG at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Oh, let's see here. Probably the um, copious amounts of Mai Tais that I'm enjoying on the beach this week. Another flex. Just a fantastic flex to the fun that you're going to have. I'm just having fun. As, as people are listening to this, are you, in the, are you in the Caribbean yet as people are listening to this? Yes. Oh. Already there. It's incredible. It's not a flex. It's just a fact. I'm in the yes. Caribbean. 
And that's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Uh, because you could be on the beach trying to make your life insurance pay off early. Moderation is my uh, key for 2023. That's good. Moderation. Well, I love getting your life insurance in order here. We talk about good decision making. You know you need it. No waiting several weeks for a decision. All their prices are affordable. Their application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. StackyBenjamins.com slash Haven Life. And when you get to the comment section, just tell them that you heard about uh, Haven Life here at the Stacky Benjamin Show. StackyBenjamins.com slash Haven Life. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to our new friend, Alicia. Hey, Alicia. Hello, my name is Alicia, and my question has to do with Roth IRA contributions and income limits. My husband and I were happily maxing all of our tax-deferred retirement accounts, HSAs, and our Roth IRAs. I picked up an adjunct professor gig last summer, and it pushed us over the income limits, and we had to take all of our contributions and pay a penalty on our earnings. Then this year, I started my own baking business as a little hobby, and it took off. I'm set to make 30 k for my side gig, so we have no chance of coming under the limits this year either. My husband works for the same primary company, and they are very generous. I work as an engineer, and he works IT. This company gives us a 15% 401k contribution against our base salaries. We do have a Roth 401k option available to us as well. Knowing that we cannot diversify with a Roth IRA, should we max out the Roth 401k option? I'm 39 and my husband's 44. We plan to retire at 55. We can access our 401k without penalty as long as we retire from the company at or after 55. We expect our income to be less at retirement, but of course, no one knows what tax rates will be. After 55, I plan to continue my baking business and teach, or who knows, maybe I'll move on to some other venture. Thank you for taking the time to answer my question. I always appreciate your thoughtfulness. Alicia, happy new year. And, but you know, before we even get to her question, OG, I just want to point out to all the stackers out there, you know, this idea of a side gig that we've talked about over the past nearly 12 years now. Alicia starts a side gig, this baking business, probably because she just likes baking, and it turns into something that creates $30,000 of additional income, likes teaching, becomes an adjunct professor. Oh, by the way, my full-time job, I'm, I'm an engineer. I got, don't get me wrong, on one thing, she's juggling a lot. But on the other side, you see people that say, I don't know where the opportunities are. I don't have any idea what I do to make money. Look at what Alicia's doing. Two things you like. Yeah. Fabulous. It's like literally the the guidebook of E-Myth. Wasn't the E-Myth person a uh, pie baker? Fantastic. I knew it. Yes. No, I was just tying it to the thing. Yes. To the uh, Absolutely. The actual storyline. Well, Doug's upset because on his Stacking Benjamins bingo board, he doesn't have that one, that square this year. And we've already, midway through the first month, checked that box. But yes, if you haven't read the E-Myth... which is how to create a business that succeeds. You, you need to get out there and read it. I'm going to start quoting different business books for Doug's purposes. <laughs> just to, just to Let's tackle. fork with him a little bit throughout the year. Well, it kind of reminds me of The Goal, really. The book, The Goal. <laughs> or maybe it's The One Minute Manager. Yeah. Meets the Monkey. That's my favorite one. Meets the Monkey. Yes. There you go. One Minute Manager yeah, Meets the Monkey. That's an old school one. Learned a lot from that one. Can we get on? with this who moved my cheese who moved doug's cheese that's what we got to ask who moved doug's cheese my cheese bro all right oh gee what exactly should alicia do if she's uh topped out in all these areas well i think that uh i really like ed slot's advice which is pay the taxes today while you have the money we don't know what tax rates are going to look like in the future but if you take a look at the trajectory of spending and consumption it stands to reason that tax rates are not going to go probably lower. And even if they did, one of the things I think that people make mistakes on when they think about their living expenses in the future is they assume that they flatline. And you say, well, I'm not planning on spending any more money in retirement than I do today. Okay, cool. But in retirement, which is 20 years away, that number is 2x what you're spending today, just to like buy the same amount of stuff. So you're already doubling your income And we've known that the IRS is not really keen on having real gigantic inflation adjustments in their brackets based on previous history. So there's a very real chance that your lifestyle will remain the same. You'll buy the same amount of 
eggs and milk and so on and so forth and do the same travel, but your tax bracket will be different because the IRS may not adjust the bracket to account for the fact that inflation has doubled your lifestyle or doubled your uh, income over that 20 year period. So I'm with Ed Slot on this. If you have the opportunity to pay taxes today and you can do it, then I would 100% do it. On top of the fact that you're getting a 15% match in your 401k, which is by all accounts gigantic, assuming that you make any reasonable income, that which I'm sure you do, that's another almost probably full 401k contribution that's going on the pre-tax side of things. The new Secure Act that we talked about on Monday allows you to pick to have your employer contributions go to the Roth. Now that's not that's not open yet. That's going to take a, a few years to to get set up. But that would be another opportunity for you to have more money that's taxed today versus taxed in the future. So yeah, I would 100% if you can from a tax standpoint consider the Roth IRA component or Roth 401k side of your investment. If you're right on that that edge of that tax bracket, so this is I think when tax planning really comes into play. If you're right on the edge of that tax bracket, maybe put some of your money pre-tax so you kind of are a little bit more tactical in your tax strategy than just dumping it all in one or the other. The other thing that you can do is if your company is super generous with their 401k match, check to see whether or not they allow you to do after maximum contributions. So some companies allow you to put money in after you reach the maximum. This year's $22,500. So after you put in twenty two five and you're under the age of 50, some companies say, well, yeah, you can put more money in. It's just you don't get any tax benefits on that. That allows you to contribute more money. And by way of conversion, you can move that into your Roth later this year. So that's affectionately known as the mega backdoor Roth IRA. So you can look at that as well. So there's a couple of different ways if you have extra money. And then finally, I would say it's not all that bad to have non-qualified brokerage account money. It gives you a ton of flexibility before you're 55 you can get your money out of your retirement plan anytime you want without penalty. You don't have to wait till 55. It's not a magic number. You could retire at 47 if you want. You just have to follow different rules. The more money that you have in different buckets that have different tax strategies assigned to them, the more flexibility you have later on down the line. So you don't have to be in despair that you don't have a specific retirement account because you make too much. Just put it in a regular account. Move on. What was the name of the guy that discovered those uh, two moons again? Doug, the first two moons? William Herschel. Yeah, do you think that William Herschel, as a scientific researcher, used the mega backdoor Roth IRA? I almost said, Joe, that's ridiculous. That didn't exist back in 1787. And then I realized the subtlety of your sophisticated humor. Yep. Just next level. Next level. I just, I don't know. Sorry. Had to do it. It was right there. I mean, for celebrating the first two moons of Uranus, I think that we need to talk about that. And then the mega backdoor Roth IRA at the same time was just a little much. It's just a little, little much. All right. Alicia, sorry for that ending. It was going so well on OG's end and I completely wrecked it. You know what? For being a good sport and hanging in there with us, we're going to send you a greatest money show on earth t-shirt that you can brag to all your friends about that you own. We'll actually send you a code and you can pick out your own from among them. However, if you'd like to be like Alicia and ask your question, stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail, and I will try not to end uh, OG's brilliant answer uh, when you call in. What kind of answer was it again? Uh, uh, brilliant. Ah, indeed. Amazing. Fantastic. Indeed. Ever so, it must be thus. Hey, lots of stuff coming up in the basement we every week go live on different channels. As I mentioned, we talked to James Martielli on an app called Fireside, and we're going to do that increasingly in 2023, where you can even ask your questions. Imagine being with a guy like James and being able to ask whatever questions you'd like after you uh, listen to our interview. To get details on that, on our free newsletter, The 201, where we dive deeper and give you actionable tips on how to take the things we talk about here in Stacking Benjamins and make them as useful as we can possibly make them. Kevin Bailey does a nice job of digging deep into resources that will help you use all the stuff we talk about here. One link will get you to all these different places. Our YouTube channel where you can watch the James Martielli interview. Go to stackybenjamins.com slash welcome, and that gives you a welcome guide with all of our different channels. If you're not here, though, for a welcome guide or to hang out with us on YouTube or on Fireside, you're here because as... 
Well, fear ramps up. As you heard James talk about, you might be feeling anxious to make some moves in your finances instead of doing what he said, which is just stand there. What you probably want to do instead is check out this free guide OG and his team put together that will help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. It's some great insights on what you should be doing and smart questions to ask yourself so you'll make financial decisions your future self will say thank you for. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackybenjamins.com slash guide to get that free guide from OG. All right. That's what's happening around here. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We'll see you guys all back here on Friday where Crystal Hammond from So So Fab is hanging out with us and the team talking real estate on Friday, OG. Going to have some fun there. Let's, uh, between now and then, go stack some Benjamins together, shall we? But, Doug... What should we have learned on this particular episode of Stacking Benjamins? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from James Martielli from Vanguard Investments. Don't play short-term games with your long-term money. Staying the course is nearly always the best course when you've determined a great outcome. But have you actually allocated your funds? If not, get started. Second, take some advice from Professor Myra Strober. Money and love? Communication is the number one name of the game. The more you communicate with potential partners, you'll make difficult decisions much, much easier. But the big lesson? Okay, Milk Day isn't the great holiday I thought it was here. Turns out the Seahigh family's lactose intolerant. Hey, Paulette, I need you to insert another Uranus joke here. Oh, wait, sounds like I just did. See ya! Thanks to Myra Strober for joining us today. You'll find her new book, Money and Love, an Intelligent Roadmap for Life's Biggest Decisions, wherever books are sold. Buying from Amazon? Find the book in our gift shop at stackingbenjamins.com slash gifts, and we'll receive a small thank you from Amazon. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SP Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Saul Seahot. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Take a deeper dive into all the topics we cover on each episode by checking out our newsletter, The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. And once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I do have a note here that I of things that we watched over the last whatever. Oh, you made a diary. I did. Well, let's let's explore Doug's diary. Dear diary. So we tried. Was it trouble with Fleischman? No, whatever. Fleischman's in trouble. Uh, uh, Fleischman's in trouble. It sort of gets depressing, and I, you know, I don't like. Here's depressing in episode one. 
Yeah, and this is probably a little too revealing, but I don't like sitting with my wife watching shows where marriages are in trouble. Or, you know, the guy, the husband is doing something so like wrong. like her going, yeah, am I right? Yeah, and the guy is just, like, doing something so wrong that I'm worried my wife is sitting there thinking, is my husband doing those things or thinking those things? Like, I don't, I just don't need that because everything's awesome and I don't need to have the little chink in the armor there that makes her start thinking. So I didn't like Fleischman's in trouble. Um, what? You got something to say there, OG? No. Me neither, by the way. You don't like doing that either? No. But we watched, or we, we actually haven't finished yet, but I will say what is remarkably good, high drama, but remarkably good, is Under the Banner of Heaven. We're watching it on Hulu. It's an FX show. Came out this year, but earlier this year. Doesn't ring a bell? No. True story about murderers, plural, in Utah, by the Mormons. It was a book written by John Krakauer, who has done some great sort of real life drama books, you know, the Mount Everest and Into, into Thin the, Air, yeah. Into Thin Air and Into, into the Wild. Thin Air. And, right. All the intos. But this one is under, not into. Ah, uh, different prepositions. Uh, but phrase. under the banner of heaven, really good acting. It's seven or eight episodes, but based on a true story about murders in the Mormon community in Utah in the early eighties. And just really well done, really well acted, would recommend so far. I think we're five episodes in. Uh, we finished up uh, The Recruit. Really enjoyed The Recruit. Not familiar with that one either. Don't know anything about it. Is it old? I can picture the header. No, it's really new. Oh. I'm almost sure it's Netflix, and uh, it is a kid who's fresh out of law school who goes to work for the Office of General Counsel for the CIA. And in order to, like, people are sending these crazy letters to the CIA all the time, apparently. They call them gray letters. They're like threats to the CIA. If you don't do this, I'm going to expose you in some major secret you don't want exposed. And most of them are crackpots. But one of them, this guy, like on his first day on the job, this is the crap work they give him to do, is to read through this giant pile of, of gray letters and see if any of them warrant some investigation. And he dives into one and realizes, oh, this one might be something. And it just pulls. So instead of just being like a lawyer in an office, the general counsel, the top guy in the legal side of the CIA says, yeah, go look into that. He ends up like CIA kid. It's kind of funny. It's not a it's not a comedy by any means, but he's got some funny lines. And uh, because he's just this young kid who has just fumbled his way through law school and just has always has never like done prep for anything, never really gets himself in the right position to be successful. He just his old mantra in life is like, I'll figure it out. And so he gets himself into these pretty serious, like espionage type situations. And he's like just fumbling his way through. And wow. it's it's very good. There's some good action in it and um, it's pretty good acting, I think. And he gets himself into uh, the whole thing's like Russian mob. So I would recommend both of those, Under the Banner of Heaven and The Recruit. Dear Diary. Yeah. And the, actually the last one, which is only for baseball fans, it's not the best sports doc I've seen, but uh, Facing Nolan, about Nolan Ryan. Oh, I've heard good things about this. Yeah, it's Dang it's it. really good. I think you got to be a baseball fan for sure. There's other sports docs you can watch and not even have to be a sports fan and just they the storytelling is so good. This is a love letter to Nolan Ryan, and it's very baseball centric. But you know, it's sort of like Tony Gwynn. Unless you were a baseball fan in the '90s, you just don't realize how amazing these guys were. And yeah, Nolan but sometimes Ryan. for people just looking into history, just trying to remember some of these people, it's pretty fun if you weren't there. You know, I mean, I like yeah. diving back into the '40s and '30s and the mm -hmm. Casey Stengels and whatever's of baseball. Sure, some of these. Interesting people in the past. Ty Cobb. Uh, oh, gee, what have you been watching? Anything good? No. No, I talked about Jack Ryan. Jack Finished Ryan it. in the middle of a work day for nine hours straight, apparently. Yeah. So what did you think about Jack Ryan? Finishing it up yesterday. Yeah, it's a, it's a Tom Clancy book. The Jack Ryan movie. Yeah. They, yeah. they all kind of smell the same. We had a text stream, the three of us back and forth, and Doug said something interesting. Really? Which we're on episode four. And uh, Cheryl was trying to half watch this show 
Doug was like, the plot has more stuff going on than season one and two. And I totally agree with that. Like, she's had to go back yeah. and rewatch. So I'm now waiting for her because she's going back because she was trying to, like, do other stuff. I don't think you right. can. I think no. this one is a little more intricate, OG. Uh, there's a lot of twists and turns. Um, we're catching up on um, we're catching up on Yellowstone. Almost completely caught up on Yellowstone now. Season four got pretty boring. Wait, what did he just do? We were talking about Jack Ryan. We wanted like an analysis of Jack Ryan, and he just I don't decided- do transitional stuff. No, I said I said my piece. I moved on to the next thing. Transitions are for losers. <laughs> Who it's needs that? Period. New paragraph. You know, the complexity of Jack Ryan reminds me of the complexity of no, Casey in you. Yellowstone. No transitional material. Just period. New I paragraph. I like chocolate chips in my ice cream. Trampolines. See. Uh, I'll I'll throw one more on the fire. I yesterday watched uh, Enola Holmes too. I I really had so much fun with Enola Holmes. I thought that was so fun. Doug's looking at me like he doesn't even know oh, what that this sounds like. Porn. Doesn't even know what, what this is, is. Enola Holmes. That's Enola Holmes is Sherlock Holmes' little sister, and so it's Sherlock Holmes' little sister played by the same young woman who plays Eleven in Stranger Things. Oh yeah, Millie Bobby Brown. Yeah, Millie Bobby plays, Brown plays her, Ugh. and I also, of course, I've always been a big fan of. Which is funny because we talked about Wednesday the other day. And about Tim Burton, and I think this is the best thing Tim Burton's done in a long time. And his spouse is in this movie, Helena Bonham Carter, who I really like, plays uh, Sherlock Holmes and Enola Holmes' mother. And it's such a fun romp. It's obviously not Academy Award material, but uh, but just good, I don't know, good fun. Enola Holmes and Enola Holmes too. Super. Former Navy SEAL Sean Ryan shares real stories from real people from all walks of life on The Sean Ryan Show. Wealth strategist Rob Luna. If you could solve a problem in this world better than anyone else, you're going to make a lot of money. And that's really what a business's ultimate goal is, whether it's your business or a manufacturing business. It's about solving a problem, making a bigger impact in people's lives than anyone else on scale. I mean, I've been trying to scale my business, but I can't find somebody to conduct these interviews. Yeah. <laughs> the Sean Ryan Show on YouTube or wherever you listen.